welcome everybody to uh, Mission Valley Community Chapel. We want to uh, quiet our hearts, um, prepare for what the Lord has for us today. Uh, all right, if you would uh, stand with me, we want to begin our worship in number 230. 230, Christ the Lord is risen today. 230. See his hand. 
All right, and then uh, next Sunday, regular services with Tomas Cantor. So um, let's pray and continue to pray for our government, federal, state, local leaders, persecuted brethren around the world. Let's uh, pray for our sick Margie Ed, and it's good to see Margie with her hat on today. Okay. Margie, does that fit in your Corvette? It fits perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay, well, good to see Margie. And, um, uh, Ed and Rachel, Diane, Prairie Jolie, uh, Roberta, Stella, and Kim Plowman. Kim, good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> and recovering, well, Sterling, Sterling is, well, so what happened, Judy? He had blood clots in his lung. Oh, yeah. He was in the hospital with, with COVID, which he got at the rehab facility, and uh, they discovered he had blood clots, so they did a procedure Thursday night uh, to break up and suck out his blood clots. Got some in his legs too, but they weren't worried about those right now. Yeah, they had to diagnose him with COPD, and I think that's. I think it might be a blood clot instead of COPD. Yeah, yeah. So let's just uh, let's pray for him. When did when did when did they? The date. Okay, let's continue to pray for those with cancer. Jeanette, uh, Tom, and Mike, Don. Uh, did Don leave? And then those recovering from surgery, Lydia and Isaiah. Isaiah's here today. Yay. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. There's Jeremiah. Yes. Let's, uh, let's pray for them. And uh, grieving the Rainbow family, Wildman, Workington, Susan Townsend. Um, oh, okay. Conlin. Cumlin Gabriel, Gabriel Hanau was born to Ashley and Joe. How do you say that name, Lord? The, the baby's name? Yeah. Cumlin? Cumlin, David. Cumlin. All right, let's uh, continue to pray for that 8 pound, 11 ounce baby boy. Let's pray for the college students, Caleb, Josiah, Peter, Elijah, and all the unsaved loved ones that we know, that we meet, that we just uh, witness to each and every day. We've got that opportunity. All right. Uh, outreach is broadcast. So Rob Tom's outreach is uh, CEF Good News Club, Real Life Ministries, like Mobile Dental Land, and White Fields National Pastors. Let's continue to, to keep all of them in our prayers. And then, is there anything else? Anybody else? Okay. I think that's it. All right, if you would uh, stand with me and turn in your hymn books to 223, Christ the Road, uh, 223. <laughs>
we would uh, remain standing, and Brother uh, Scott is going to lead us in uh, pastoral prayer. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great love that was displayed there at the cross, where Jesus paid for our sins, and that you said it paid in full. Lord, we're so thankful that Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe, Lord, and we're thankful that he rose from the dead, that we also can walk in newness of life. Lord, we just thank you for that blessed hope of being in the place that Jesus is preparing for us, that where he is, there we may be also. Lord, help us to remember daily that we've been bought with a price, that we're not our own, that we might glorify in our body and spirit that are yours. Lord, just uh, pray for our nation that's in great need. Lord, that we would humble ourselves and pray, seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, that you might hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. Lord, we just pray for those in authority that they would seek your wisdom and the decisions that they make. Lord, that uh, they would realize that they must give an account, Lord, someday to you uh, for the decisions that they made, Lord. Continue to be with persecuted brethren around the world, that they would continue on, Lord, and that... Uh, Christ would be seen in their lives, and Lord, that people would come to you uh, because uh, of their testimony. Continue, Lord, to be with Jeffrey Woodkey and his family. We thank you for his release and, and pray that you would just use him, Lord, for your glory now and his family, and also ask that you would be with those that are sick, that they might know your grace, which is sufficient, your comfort, Lord, for those that have lost loved ones, for the blessed hope of being reunited in heaven, Lord again someday soon continue to be with those recovering from surgery and lord for uh, the birth here of uh comlin gabriel Hono, who was born uh just a few days ago lord we thank you for that and pray lord that he would be brought up in your ways and that you would use him mightily for yourself continue to be with our college students lord that they would uh, be in the word lord to be able to be steadfast in the faith that stand against uh, false teachings that uh, many are taught in schools today, Lord. We pray that they would be built up in the faith. Continue to be with our unsaved loved ones. Bring someone across their path to share with them the words of life, that they might have a godly sorrow that works repentance unto salvation. Lord, continue to bless the, bless the broadcast going forth through Thomas Sarab and the CEF Good News Clubs as they prepare for the outreach at the fair and the three-person teams that you would raise up laborers, Lord, for these uh, great outreaches. Continue to bless all the missionaries we support here, Lord, that we might remember them and support them in prayer and financially as you give us ability that we may be fellow laborers with them as they seek to work with you in saving the lost. Now help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus and be available and usable for him, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be hearing from uh, Mike and Tammy Dresky, serving uh, in Glacier View, Alaska, with Victory Bible Camp. Right. Hello, Mission Valley Church, and greetings from the beautiful Midwest. By way of introduction, I'm Mike and Tammy Dresky. We are super excited about the chapter that God has us on, and the journey we've been on the last few years is coming to a culmination in the next few months. As we're going to be spending time at Victory Bible Camp, Lord willing, we'll be joining the full-time staff and serving as the director. On behalf of Victory Bible, I want to thank you for your faithful financial support. It is so appreciated. And when it comes to Christian camping, I'm not sure that there's many other ministries that have the platform and the impact like Christian camping to proclaim the life-changing message of the cross and grace. So thank you for being a part of it. Lord willing, I look forward to meeting you soon. Sometime in Alaska.
Thank you so very much for your faithful giving to Victory Ministries for our new director here at Victory Bible Camp. He will be coming here and continuing our legacy of sharing the great news of Christ and discipling children and youth and adults for generations to come. Sam, but Sam's in a different church this morning. He's preaching a message of resurrection, I'm sure. How wonderful. Great day. Happy day today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we have, Lord, the resurrection as a reality to look back on, to remember, to refresh ourselves, Lord, to encourage us because we worship a resurrected Christ. Help us now, Lord, to, to learn more and to that will lead us to more service and worship to our great King, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn your Bibles to the resurrection chapter in the book of John, John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we're going to be looking at here the first 10 verses in John chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 10. And, uh, John chapter, 10, uh, chapter, chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene when early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone away, taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre and he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lying. 
and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. It's very interesting to look at the fourth day of creation. The fourth day of creation was very important because it was on that fourth day of creation that God made what he called lights in the sky, which were the sun and the moon and the stars. And he said that there were certain purposes. God had certain purposes for creating the sun and the moon and the stars. And he stated what those purposes were in Genesis 1.14. Genesis 1.14 on the fourth day of creation. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Among the reasons for why God made the sun and the moon and was to divide the day from the night, to, to divide the light from the darkness. And God said also, let them be for seasons. Now, when we hear the word seasons, we think of spring, summer, winter, and fall. Except sometimes Clint gets confused about it. <laughs> but the Hebrew word used here for seasons is a special word, mo'ed. Mo'ed. And if the translators would have asked me, which they didn't, I would have told them, don't use the word seasons for mo'ed. Because the word moed does not mean seasons. Here's how moed is used in another place in Scripture, in Leviticus 23.2. Leviticus 23.2. Leviticus Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feasts, concerning the moed of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even those are my feasts. Moed means feasts or holidays or as the NIV has translated it correctly, sacred times. So one of the important reasons why God made the sun and the moon and the stars was Genesis 1.14. Genesis 1.14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the light from the day, and let them be for signs and for holidays, or certain time, or sacred times, and for days and years. That means it's very important to God that we keep certain holidays. This time of the year has three very important holidays, which cause us to remember what God saved us from, how God saved us. And, and, and these holidays are Passover. Passover. Passover is a remembrance of how horrible Egypt was. Egypt was a literal, horrible, hopeless imprisonment of the Jewish people, which is symbolic of the horrible, hopeless imprisonment that all people are in because of their sins. A prison of guilt, a prison of shame. God's Passover holiday was all about the death of the Passover lamb, the lamb of God to save people. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was said to be the one who takes away the sin of the world. He saves people by taking away the sin of the world. The lambs of, the lambs of Passover were killed, and the blood of those lambs were put over the doorpost on the top and on the side. So that God, God said, when I see the blood, when I see that you have a Passover lamb, I will pass over you and the death will not come to the first point. The Passover shows how horrible sin was. The second feast, which is very important to remember, is Good Friday. Good Friday is the holiday 
that remembers how God saved us from sin. How God saves us from hell. On Good Friday, we remember that God saved man by the death of God's Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins in order to save us from hell. And then Easter, or Resurrection Day. Easter is the holiday where we remember also how God accepted, accepted the death of God's Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins and from hell. So when we look at these three holidays together, Passover, Good Friday, and Easter, there's like one word for each holiday that we could shout for each holiday. Passover shouts out the word help, help to save from a hopeless imprisonment, seen in symbol and representation in the literal imprisonment of Jewish people who had no hope of getting out. Help is the word for Passover. Passover is when we also look at ourselves and like the Jewish people who needed God's help to free them from Egypt, we say, our sins are beyond us. Our sins have ruined us. We need help from God. That's Passover. The word for Passover is help. Good Friday shouts out the word accomplished, which is what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross and he paid the price for all our sins. Good Friday is when we look not at ourselves, we did that in Passover, but Good Friday is when we look at Christ on the cross and we say Christ is our Passover lamb that saved us from our sins in hell. The word for Good Friday is the word accomplished, which was the last word that Jesus Christ spoke on the cross when he said in Hebrew, Asaph which is the last word in the Psalm, 22nd Psalm, which is about the crucifixion. He, Asaf, he did this. In, he, in Greek, we have the word telestai, it means the same thing. Accomplished. Accomplished is the word for Good Friday. Easter shouts out the word accepted, which is what God said when he brought Jesus Christ up out of the grave into life in the resurrection. Easter is when we look at God the Father who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead and we say God accepted the death of Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb who saves us from sins and from hell. <clears throat> so these are the three holidays that fall together and it's so important for us to remember each year God set the lights in the heavens to help us to remember a holiday such as these. Today is the day when we remember what happened on Easter Day when Christ was resurrected from the grave. And what better way to remember that momentous day than through the eyes of three persons. The three persons who first discovered the resurrection on that day. And they are Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, and the Apostle John. The first person who we're going to we're, we're going to pretend to be, or we're going to look through the eyes of at the resurrection is Mary Magdalene in verse 1. Verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre. <coughs> and see if the stone take away from that sepulchre. We're first told about the time that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. It was on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, today. And by the way, the resurrection is so monumental that because it occurred on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, Sunday has replaced for us Saturday as the Lord's day, as the one day of the week that we set aside and dedicate to God as we focus on God. Well, first we're told in verse 1 that it was on the first day of the week, and that tells that, that Mary was, it, it, it was, it was looking for the first opportunity after the Sabbath to go to the tomb. And that shows us how anxious she was to get to the tomb. And we're told furthermore about the time of the day in verse 1. That it was very early in the morning. It was still dark outside when Mary went to the tomb. 
And again, it tells, shows us how anxious Mary was to get to the tomb. Mary went alone that very early in the morning when it was still dark. That was dangerous for a woman to be out alone in the dark, especially as she expected to encounter those Roman guards at the tomb who had no respect or regard for Jewish women. But personal danger did not stop Mary from going alone when it was dark. Mary was determined to reach the tomb as soon as she could to anoint the corpse of Jesus with the spices according to Mark 16.1. And it's significant that Mary Magdalene was the first to the tomb that morning. It was not Mary the mother of Jesus who was the most anxious to care for the deceased body of her son, the body of Jesus. More than Mary the mother of Jesus was Mary Magdalene. Why? There was an incident with a former prostitute that she was, whose sins had been forgiven her in, 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 in Luke 7, 37, Luke 7, 37. Behold, the woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, bought, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, referring to Jesus, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. She's a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto the Pharisee, I have somewhat to say unto thee. He saith, Master, speak on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. One owed him 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? The Pharisee answered and said, I suppose he that to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to the Pharisee, See if thou this woman, I entered into thy house. Again, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. This woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou dost not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loves much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Mary Magdalene was another person who was possessed with seven devils, and Christ freed her from those seven devils. And that's what made Mary love Christ so much. She knew how much Christ had helped her, and she knew how great a sinner she was. That's why she loved him so much. Mary is love. Mary is love from the heart. The more a person knows how much he's a sinner, how much Christ has freed him from, how many sins he has been, he or she has been forgiven of, the more that person will love Christ, that's Mary Magdalene. That's who she is. So Mary, she reaches the tomb alone, she sees the tomb, and the tomb is carved out of a rock with a very narrow, small opening, and a very heavy stone that fit inside the opening to seal the tomb. The soldiers are evidently gone. She does, she, she sees this, we can imagine her heart racing with, the, with, 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 with anticipation, with anxiety, with fear, and with this unexpected sight. And questions flood her. Where are the soldiers? Where's the stone? Not where it should have been. Why is it that way? What happened to the seal on the tomb? She looks enough inside to see that the tomb's empty. And then she runs away. She runs away to tell Peter and John in verse 2, verse 2. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And she saith unto him, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. We know not where they've laid him. When Mary saw that the tomb was empty, it was like lightning had struck Mary. And she was filled with fear. Mary assumes that someone has stolen the body away. As she says in verse 2, in verse 2 she says, They've taken away the Lord, and we know not where they have laid him. What Mary had seen should have brought her the greatest joy and happiness, as it does for us today. 
if only Mary would have thought the best with the empty tomb when she saw it. But instead, when Mary saw the empty tomb, she thought the worst about the empty tomb. What should have brought her the most joy and the happiness to see an empty tomb brought her the worst worry and fear because she assumed the worst. Isn't that what we do in life? Isn't that us? We're just like Mary. We see something and we think the worst. We let the lightning of fear and worry hit us like it hit Mary. So Mary runs to Peter, she runs to John, she tells him the terrible news, terrible news, the body of Christ has been stolen away and we don't know where. Isn't it interesting that what the religious Jews were afraid of in Matthew 27, 61, Matthew 27, 61. And there was Mary Magdalene, the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher the next day that followed the day of the preparation. The chief priests and Pharisees came together into Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away. And say unto the people, He has risen from the dead, so the last heir shall be worse than the first. Pilate said to him, You have a watch, go your way. The greatest fear that the chief priests, the Pharisees had, was that the disciples of Christ were going to steal the body of Christ. And now the greatest fear that Mary Magdalene has is that those chief priests and the Pharisees are going to steal the body of Christ. No one stole the body of Christ. But both of them were afraid that the other was going to steal the body of Christ. The reason the chief priests and the Pharisees were afraid of the body of Christ being stolen away was because they said in Matthew 27, 63, Matthew 27, 63, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. The enemies of Christ remembered that Jesus Christ had said when he was alive that he was going to rise from the dead. <clears throat> But Mary Magdalene and Peter and John, somehow, they did not remember that Christ said that he would rise from the dead. So as we look at the resurrection, through the eyes of the first one to see the empty tomb, Mary Magdalene, we feel the fear, we feel the worry that she felt over what should have made her so happy. And that was all because of unbelief. She heard Christ speak about his resurrection from the dead, but unbelief crept into her soul like an infection, and it made her reluctant to believe. So that when she saw the evidence that Christ had risen from the grave, she refused to believe what Christ said. And as a result, Mary's unbelief robbed her. It stole away from her which should have been the immense joy and happiness for that moment. Unbelief drove Mary into a state of, oh no, his body was stolen. Whereas belief would have driven Mary to a state of, oh yes, his body has been resurrected. Unbelief in the Bible fills us with, oh no, in life. But belief in the Bible fills us with, oh yes, in life. Now we see in verse 3 that as soon as Peter hears Mary's report of, oh no, Peter, along with John, they just take off like a flash. They are running in verse 3. Verse 3, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple that came to the sepulcher. What's interesting from verse 3 is that Peter and John are together. Someone missed that little note there that Peter and John are together. Because the last time we saw Peter was horrible for Peter. It was at the trial of Jesus, and we, Peter was standing there, and, the, and, 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 and some a person came to Peter on different occasions and said, oh, you're one of them, you're, you were with him. And Peter swore that he didn't even know who Jesus was, Matthew 27. 26, 71, Matthew 26, 71. When, he was, when Peter was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter denied with an oath, I do not know the man. 
And after a while came unto him that stood by and said unto Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech gives you away. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. That's the last time we saw Peter, when Peter cursed and swore, I swear, he said, I've never met this man, Jesus. I don't know Jesus. That was a horrible denial. That was the lowest time in Peter's life. Shameful, and it caused Peter to go out and cry in bitterness over what he had done. Peter turned his back on Christ. It would have been so easy for the other disciples just to have rejected Peter and said, you're not one of us. But the fact that we see here, Peter with John in verse 3, shows us the other disciples did not hold that against Peter. The other disciples forgave Peter for denying Christ. The other disciples did not take the position with Peter of, how could you have done something so horrible as that? Instead, the other disciples looked at what happened and they realized how easily they could have done the same thing. The other disciples did what we are told to do when someone falls in Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Not standing in judgment, over a fallen person, but to look at ourselves and say, what, for the grace of God, there goes I. There was Peter, who was so clearly overtaken in a fault when he denied Christ. And what's so wonderful about verse 3 is that we see that John, representing the other disciples, they throw open their arms, their hearts to Peter, and they said, Peter, you're no Judas Iscariot. You're our brother. We not only forgive you, but we embrace you in the spirit of restoration. That's wonderful to see. And just a little note that's just embedded in verse 3. And we see how Peter's horrible past has been forgotten. And the most wonderful words that a person can hear about their past is, that, is how effective the death of the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, was for sins. The greatest message for us that comes from the resurrection is the message that comes from God all about our sins. Because the resurrection of Christ is God's message to us about our sins. And that message is, it's all over now. It's past. It's passed over. It's all over. It's in the past. That's the message that comes from the resurrection. Because one word shouted from, the, from, from heaven with the act of the resurrection, that word was accepted. Accepted. You do not have to pay for your sins in hell. Because Jesus, the Passover lamb, was accepted by God. And now God can, because of the resurrection, take all of our sins and just drop them in the deepest part of the sea. Micah 7, 19. Micah 7, 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea and never retrieve them. Because of the resurrection... God can take all our sins and put them behind God's memory forever. Out of God's memory. Isaiah 43.25 Isaiah 43.25 I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will remember no more thy sins. Because of the resurrection God can take all our sins and put them out of his sight. Take them and put them out of his sight. Isaiah 38, 17. Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul, delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Is the resurrection important? The resurrection is important because the resurrection is God's stamp that goes on our sin debt. As Scott prayed this morning, the stamp reads... Paid in full. And when Peter and John heard that the tomb was empty, they both didn't know. They both didn't know what to believe, but they ran. Actually, John actually outran Peter. And Peter was the one who, 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 who boldly, in verse 6, verse 6, then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and see if the Lord lived in close life. 
group. So looking at the resurrection through the eyes of Peter, Peter now, he gives us the close-up of what is inside the tomb. He looks inside. There's three persons who are involved in coming to the tomb, Mary Magdalene and Peter and John. But by using each of their eyes to look at the tomb, we see completely different perspectives of the tomb, of the, of the resurrection. Because each person is, is totally different from the other. Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John are as, as different as can be. And if we were to give one word to describe each person so that we can understand what eyes we're looking through, we have the first person who's all full of, of emotion, fear, worry, and love. That's Mary. Mary is the person who frets by saying, verse 2, verse 2, they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre and we know not where they've laid him. Mary is emotional, very disturbed and distraught, but she's also a person of love. The one word that we could use to describe Mary is feel. Feel. Mary is feel. Mary feels what she observes by the empty tomb. Then we come to Peter. Peter. He rushes into the tomb. John arrives at the tomb first, but John stops. He doesn't go in the tomb. He's cautious. Not Peter. Peter rushes in. What does it say? We're, 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 we're fools fear to tread. That's Peter. He rushes right in with no caution, no thought of what he might find, no thought of whether it's the right thing to do to rush into the tomb. He rushes in because with Peter, there's no time to think. There's only time to move. And if we were to give one word to Peter, it would be the word act. Act. Peter is all about action. Peter acts without thinking. Peter feels a burning passion inside of him to make a move. And he makes a move. And because of that, Peter makes the discovery of what's in the tomb. In verses 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7, Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin, which is about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. It's Peter who discovers the linen clothes that Christ put on, that w w was put into during the burial by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And as Peter sees those linen clothes lying there, we don't know what Peter thought about but there was a loud and clear message from the fact that those linen clothes were lying there. The message was, this is not the scene of body robbers. Someone who would rob the body of Jesus would just take the body, linen clothes and all. It makes no sense for a corpse stature, a, 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 a thief of, corp, of a corpse, to take a naked corpse. So the fact that the linen clothes were left there did not support Mary's fear in, 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 when she said they had taken away my, the Lord and we know not where they laid him. If there were robbers, then the linen clothes would have been, been, would have been taken away or, or maybe thrown all over the place. But these linen clothes were in an orderly pile, which robbers want to get out of there fast and do. So there was another message that came from the linen clothes lying there, and that is in the resurrection, Christ had no need of those clothes anymore. And that's important for us because Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. And that means that we will have no need of, of, of clothes or any possessions that we have here on earth when we go to heaven. We see this in the we see this truth symbolized when Jacob, with the Jewish people, were called to go from Canaan into Egypt. It was actually Jacob's son Joseph, who was the ruler of Egypt, and, and Pharaoh under Pharaoh. And, 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 and Jacob was told that he would receive so much in Egypt that it would be ridiculous for him to gather up his puny stuff that he had in Canaan and bring those things into Egypt. Because Jacob was told in Genesis 45, 17, Genesis 45, 17, Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, this do ye, lay your beasts and go and get you into the land of Canaan and take your father and your household and come unto me. And I will give you the good of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take your wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, for your wives, bring your father and come. 
And also, regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. When Christ left his clothes behind, he showed us that when we are called to go with Christ, that what we think, that, that we should not think about anything that we're going to leave behind, any possessions. What the impulsive Peter saw when he entered into that empty tomb was a very orderly scene of clothes lying there. And that speaks about the time when Christ left the tomb. He left the tomb calmly with the grave clothes set in an orderly manner, with a complete calmness, even though Christ was in the middle of the horrors of a dark tomb, he was not moved by that dark tomb because in the resurrection, Christ was living the prophecy that predicted Christ would not remain in the grave to be eaten by worms in Psalm 1610. Psalm 1610, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption or decay. Even though Christ has died, he's been buried, Christ has heard the voice of God the Father who called him to be resurrected from the dead and to come and to sit down at the right hand of God the Father. Psalm 110, 1, Psalm 110, 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Even though death, it seems to have had the victory over Christ. It was Christ who through death had the victory over death. And Christ was living the joy of that victory over death that the prophecy says in Isaiah 25, 8, Isaiah 25, 8, He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord will wipe away all tears from all faces and the rebuke of this people shall he take away from off the earth for the Lord has spoken it. Even the grave, even though the grave looked so powerful before the resurrection, in the resurrection, Christ had the power over the power of the grave, as predicted in Hosea 13, 14, Hosea 13, 14, when he said, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. And as we sung this morning, the verse says, O grave, I will be thy destruction. All these messages were spoken by the orderly pile of the grave clothes that Christ left behind. This was the message that Peter saw when he barged into that empty tomb. And what's so interesting is that we're looking at the resurrection through the eyes of these three people who are Mary Magdalene, who are Peter, and who are John. And we have to remember that these three persons were the only persons who first saw the evidence of the resurrection. The resurrection was not a public event. We're looking at the resurrection through the eyes of these three people because they were the ones who first saw the evidence of the resurrection. The resurrection was not a public event. The evidence of the resurrection was seen by this select small group, at first these three, and <clears throat> these are the three people. As a matter of fact, Christ never showed himself alive after the resurrection to all the people, only to a small group. And that's what's emphasized in Acts 10.40. Acts 10, <clears throat> him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. The revelation of the resurrection was only to a select few. The crucifixion, that was a public event. That was seen by all people. But the resurrection was not revealed to the public, only to a select few. And we would have said, oh, we got backwards. We would have said, no, let the death of Jesus Christ be private. Let the death of Christ not be seen by everyone. Let the resurrection be public. Let the resurrection of Christ be seen by all. But that's not what God said. That's not what God thought. God said, let the death of Christ be seen by all, and the resurrection seen by just a few. That shows us how our thinking way is not God's thinking way. As it says in Isaiah 55, 8, Isaiah 55, 8, my, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The reason 
why God chose for the death of Christ, so shameful as it was, so horrible, to be public, and the resurrection, so wonderful, so exalting of Christ, to be private, is because the death of Christ is where a person starts to be saved from their sins. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my sins fell away. The start of the saving relationship with God is at the cross. That's where Christ died for our sins. What puts a, put, what puts a person off the road to hell and on the road to heaven is a trust in Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. The blood was on the doorposts of the house in Egypt where all could see it. But Jesus Christ died openly where all could see it. And a person has to say, I believe that Christ who died on the cross was the Passover lamb that I want to put my trust in, to take my sins away. I want him as my Passover lamb. That happens at the cross where Christ died for our sins. But the revelation of the resurrection was to a select few. And that select few are those who saw the resurrection. They were to become those who made the news of the resurrection public and tell the world that we see followers of Christ doing today. As it says in Acts 2.25, Acts 2.25, David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He's on my right hand, I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad, Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made me to know the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried. His sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loin, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see. When Peter burst, into that empty tomb, Peter not only saw the grave clothes, but lying in order to say, he also saw something else, which is called out for us in verse 7, verse 7. The napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Peter saw this napkin, this napkin cloth that was about the head of Christ. It was wrapped around the head of Christ, and it wasn't lying with the, with the linen clothes. The head napkin was lying by itself. And it is an emphasis about how the head napkin was folded orderly in verse 7. Verse 7, wrapped together in a place by itself. The folded napkin was a message that was left behind by Christ. And, his, and, and the message was like this. If, for example, if you were at a dinner, if you were at a dinner at another person's house in those days, and you had to leave the table for some reason. Maybe you had to go to the restroom, or maybe someone came to the door, or whatever. And you had to get up from the dinner to, to for whatever reason. You had you had to leave the table. And let's say you weren't finished eating yet. You still were going to come back and finish your food. What you would do is that you would leave that message on the table, and that message that, hey, I'm not finished yet. Don't clean up my area here. I'm coming back. You, 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 what you would do is you would leave a message and you would take your napkin and you would just neatly fold it like this. You wouldn't throw it on the table and say, I'm done. You would neatly clean it with your, And that sends the message. That sends a message. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And, 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 and if you weren't finished and you were not coming back, then you would just toss the napkin there. This napkin that was about his head was folded carefully. And what Peter saw with that napkin was like, it was on Christ's head was not the, with a, not in the grave clothes in the pile, but so nicely folded up and folded back. It, it was a message, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Peter is the word act. He 
rushes into the empty tomb. He sees all these signs of the orderly victory over death. Christ is coming back. But he doesn't put it all together. He just acts. He just moves. Now we come. And we look at the resurrection through the eyes of John. The one who stops. The one who considers. The one who thinks about this. If there's one word that we would use to describe John, it's the word think. Mary's feel. Peter is at, but John is think. John stops outside the tomb. He peers inside. He sees what Peter saw, but he thinks it through. He is a, he, 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 he's, a, he, he, he's the meditator who's mulling on what he sees so he can draw conclusions. Mary's feeling, Peter is acting, John is thinking. Mary is sensing what she saw, Peter is moving to see, and John is processing what he saw. Mary is desiring, Peter is projecting, and John is concluding. And what John concludes in verse 8, verse 8 is, Then went in there also the, the disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, because he thought. God revealed the resurrection to John as he thought. John is so humble here, John doesn't even say his name. He just says in verses 8 and, and 4 and 8, that simply that, that other disciple is talking about himself. But, John confesses, I should have known about the empty tomb that Mary reported. And he confesses about himself and the others in verse 9, they knew not the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. What we see with the resurrection, we need all three persons in us. With Mary, we have a heart of love to, to Christ. With Peter, we have feet that move and with John, we have a head that thinks. And a heart that a heart that only loves and doesn't move and doesn't think, that's not effective for God. And, and feet that only move without a heart that loves, or without a mind that thinks, that's not effective for God. And a head that thinks but has no heart to love and has no move, feet to move, is not effective for God. All three of these people we should incorporate the heart of Mary to love, the feet of, of, of Peter to move out and proclaim the resurrection, and the mind of John to process it all into belief. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the resurrection. And thank you, Lord, for these three today that we've been able to consider. Help us to have the heart of Mary, the feet of Peter, and the mind of John. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you'd uh, turn in your hymn book to 669-669 uh, on this beautiful Easter morning, afternoon, uh, what a great song to sing, Heavenly Sunlight, 669.